for short and long-term challenges. We'll have another go, my lords. Motion for debate for short and long-term challenges presented by Long Covid, Baroness Thornton. Thank you, my lords. I think the first thing that I need to say is that, long, that, is that COVID is not over. People are still catching COVID, some are still being very ill, some ending up with long COVID. Our NHS is still battling with COVID itself and the terrible effect it has had on the whole of the NHS's ability to do its job and catch up with the backlog which COVID produced on top of the waiting lists which already existed and were growing in 2019 before the pandemic. And that, my Lords, is the background of our discussion today. Given the number of speakers across the House for this debate, I'm very pleased that so many agree it's about time we reflected on the emerging short and long-term challenges of long COVID. And I'd like to thank the Library, the British Medical Association, Nuffield Health and many others who've provided us with such large quantities of briefing. I thank all the speakers who will follow me and I anticipate a well-informed debate which will no doubt be challenging for the Minister, not least because this is, although this is designated a health debate, I think if 2.1 million, and I have seen lower and higher figures, of our fellow citizens are reporting experiencing some or many of the range of symptoms of long COVID, then this has wider societal implications. It affects the workplace, incomes, families, and of course our health, mental health and social care services. It raises questions about defining disab disabling, a disabling condition which will affect treatment, support, insurance, pensions, income support, careers, jobs and reasonable adjustments which need to be made. And of course, how do we support our children who may get long COVID? Part of the challenge, my laws, is that it seems that there is yet no internationally agreed clinical definition of long COVID. And the evidence based on what constitutes long COVID in terms of range and length of symptoms is still emerging. In October 2021, the World Health Organization defined, and I quote, post-COVID-19 condition as occurring in individuals with a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, usually three months from the onset of COVID-19 with symptoms, and that lasts for at least two months and cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. More recently, NICE have said in their guidance on managing the long-term effects of COVID-19, which covers care, care for people, and I quote again, people who have signs and symptoms that develop during and after an infection consistent with COVID-19 continue for more than four weeks and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. Common symptoms, as noble lords will be aware of, include fatigue, shortness of breath, chest pain, problems with memory, heart palpitations, dizziness, joint pain, and many, many other symptoms. My laws, to, ad un to advance our understanding of long COVID, it is crucial, therefore, that prevalence data is collected. And that really is my first substantive point and question to the Minister. Government commitments have been made, for example, in June 2021. NHS England committed to setting up a long COVID registry to collect long COVID activity data. However, to date, data is not collected accurately and consistently across the UK, meaning the UK government is still relying on the ONS self-reported data. So when will uh, this important data collection happen in a consistent fashion is my first question to the Minister. Currently, my laws, there are a lot of unknowns when it comes to treating long COVID. Despite recent investment, more research is needed to increase the understanding of the condition, including psychological aspects and developing more effective treatments. So in October 2020, NHS England and the NHS Improvement set out a five-point plan for long COVID support, which included a commitment of £50 million to fund research. The government said that 20 million of the 50 million previously committed to research would go into 15 UK-based research studies through the NIHR, National Institute for Health Research, to better understand the condition, improve diagnosis and find new treatments. As part of this investment, various studies investigating whether there might be potential pharmaceutical treatments would be effective in treating long COVID. 
While well, long COVID is also a focus for researchers globally, with the European Commission announcing that it would accelerate its research into long COVID and develop treatments, while the United States is also running clinical trials. So I'd like to ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, is whether we are participating in these research programmes and what is the outcome of that. Similarly, major pharmaceutical companies have demonstrated an interest in developing targeted new treatments or repurposing existing ones. And although researchers have been surveying the broad spectrum of symptoms associated with long COVID, it is, has to be said, I think, that they have not found one biological explanation. It is likely there are various mechanisms involved. Similarities between long COVID and other post-infection syndromes will need to be considered, and I am confident that that will be raised in the debate today. Despite the investment into research for treatments for long COVID, much of the research is in its early stages, resulting in a lack of evidence on effective treatments. And my laws also, in terms of resourcing, it would seem that only 60,000 patients can access treatment of the million more or more who have, are reporting with long COVID. And my Lord, that means that, that hundreds of thousands of people with long COVID are feeling isolated and frustrated in their search for treatment. And sometimes they are as a result of this living in poverty and despair. And I would like to commend the patient groups that have been doing a great job in mutual support and campaigning. And I, I, I commend them for it. But let's look at the research, which has to be much more. And it is true the government agreed to invest £50 million in research. However, I think there are some blockages, which is what I'd like to raise with the Noble Lord, the Minister. Approvals to facilitate research pathways and through developing pathways to develop more rapid implementation of promising findings in relation to diagnosis, assessment and treatment of long COVID. It, it would seem that despite this increased, um, increased funding in research, that the UK government needs to increase the infrastructure to meet the scale of this problem. It would seem that whilst the MHRA, through the Innovative Licensing and Access Pathway, aims to increase the time, it, aims to accelerate the time it takes to get treatments to market, that there may need to be some changes to clinical trials research legislation to enable this to be carried out. Is that the case and is the government considering this and what, what should happen? Because it seems to me absolutely vital that if the research is there and the pharmaceutical industry wants to bring forward treatments that we should make sure that that pathway is completely clear of any obstacles. Turning to work-related challenges, because there are huge issues concerning work and long COVID. First, is the issue, and, and first the issue is the need to support post-pandemic return to work, which we've discussed before in the House. Since the pandemic, there's been a marked increase in the number of workers aged 60 to, 50 to 64 who have left employment. It's cited in, in recent labour market statistics from the ONS found that the number of people in this age group classified as economically inactive stood at 374,000 plus in the period from June to August this year, compared with 37,000 in the first three months of 2020 before, as COVID-19 took hold. And in a recent analysis by the ONS, they found that 51% of the people in this age category had left work since the pandemic had not gone back, but many had reported physical and mental health conditions and illness including long COVID. So apart from anything else, this points to people needing extra support from employers to prevent them being squeezed out of the marketplace. Guidelines for employers, it seems to me, are required here. And the question I'd like to ask the Noble Lord, the Ministry is, are they available? Are they being planned? And there are health and social care workers who have been particularly exposed during the pandemic. And long COVID, of course, makes it even more difficult for the NHS to function as it should to say nothing of the lives which are being wrecked and the families who are suffering terribly. The Industrial, the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council has made its recommendations to the Secretary of State regarding the circumstances in which long COVID should be prescribed as a, an occupational disease. So why has the government not acted on this? COVID special leave provisions ended across the UK by 1st of September 2022. 
I have to say the British Medical Association have repeatedly called for enhanced COVID-19 sickness pay provision to continue until a long-term strategy for dealing with COVID-19 is in place. And I need to know why the government has not put a sufficient compensation scheme in place for healthcare workers who are developing long COVID. And further to this, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions published the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council report on COVID-19 and its occupational impacts. This report was provided to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and was laid before Parliament yesterday by the Secretary of State and thank the Noble Lord the Minister for making it available to the House. The Council argues that there is sufficient evidence to recommend prescription for health and social care workers who work brings them into frequent proximity to patients and clients where there is a significant increase of the risk of infection, subsequent illness and death. So will the government now, it has that report and it has been made public, act upon it? My Lords, we need to address the issue of preventing long COVID in children. So will the government develop a campaign with more consistent messaging about long COVID and clear information and guidance for parents regarding the benefits of vaccination for children and how that actually can protect children from long COVID? Clearly, there needs to be more support for health professionals to identify and treat long COVID. All health professionals should be supported and equipped with up-to-date information to ensure they understand the variable symptoms of long COVID, are aware of the available support, how to refer people to it. Funding and resources to establish multidisciplinary services, pathways for long COVID should focus on addressing patients' multi-system multi symptoms and rehabilitation needs and provide individualised care plans accordingly. There also needs to be a more consistent provision of long COVID clinics, including for children. So there is less variation in waiting times for treatment, increased funding and independent workforce planning is key to the success of these services. So I'd like to ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, how many more multidisciplinary centres are planned and by when? Improved financial and wider support for people unable to work due to long COVID, the government really needs, it's an urgent matter, I think, to, to provide employers with better guidance on how to support employees with long COVID. Perhaps the government should set up a task force to review the UK statutory sick pay system allowance and whether this should be increased so it is in line with OECD countries. Does the Noble Lord the Minister accept that the decision to end special COVID leave for NHS staff actually has put patients and healthcare workers at risk? Why does the government not reinstate the scheme until a longer term compensation scheme to, to support staff is in place? At the end of this debate, I would welcome an acknowledgement by the Noble Lord the Minister that the government recognises that long COVID is having a major impact on productivity, employment and wider society as well as our health services. And I'd like the Noble Lord the Minister to tell me that the government has a plan for this to be tackled in a comprehensive fashion across the government. I beg to move. The question, is, the, the question is that this motion be agreed to. Uh, Lord, I'd like to start by thanking the noble Baroness, uh, Baroness Thornton, for bringing about this important debate. Uh, she's held the government's feet to the fire. In fact, she held my feet to the fire uh, on uh, this issue, uh, and I absolutely commend her persistence. Uh, my Lords, rehabilitation in general and uh, post-viral syndromes in particular have a long history in this country of being horribly overlooked and that regretful neglect has contributed, I'm afraid, darkly to the long-term poor health of many in this nation. Uh, but before I speak of the consequences of this in, in, over long COVID, can I just take a moment to recognise that Britain has done more than almost any other country to address long COVID. Uh, Professor Chris Whitty in the CMO's office prioritised uh, NIHR research with £50 million going into 19 projects, uh, giving a clear signal for other research. The NHS, and in particular the Noble Lord, Lord Stevens of Birmingham, launched a welcome five-point plan that the Noble Baroness mentioned, and Amanda Pritchard has rolled out uh, excellent long-term uh, long COVID clinics. 
Treatments like monoclonal antibodies and pulmonary rehabilitation are emerging as a result. And can I pay tribute to Dr. Harry Brunge, who pioneered the Breathe program at the English National Opera, a fantastic example of social prescribing, which has produced some very promising clinical trial results. Uh, can I uh, thank the noble Lord, Lord Darzai, who kicked off the important REACT program at Imperial College, which has generated hefty longitudinal population studies? Uh, and lastly, can I pay tribute to the patient groups who are both vocal and thoughtful in their response for um, uh, their testimony? But, my Lords, despite these considerable collective efforts, I am sad to say that the long COVID story has become a parable for how the UK health system fails to protect people's freedom from disease and illness. It fails to properly rehabilitate our sick, uh, and we're paying a horrible economic price as a result. My Lords, the scale of long COVID is enormous, as the noble Baroness rightly pointed out, but our, that clinical response that I referred to is sadly inadequate. The ONS says there are 1.5 million sufferers, yet the long COVID clinics can only see 60,000 patients a year. Patient groups are frustrated that when they do get seen, clinicians don't have the latest pathways that might lead to positive outcomes. NIHR agree with patients that there are a lot of unanswered questions. My Lords, we are familiar in this country with the rationing of scarce health resources and the uneven distribution of the latest research, uh, uncomfortable though that is. But I would like to focus a few words on the profound economic effects of this troubling British healthcare strategy. Uh, the ONS data reports that 500,000 uh, have left the workforce uh, over the last 18 months, and 75,000 of those are economically inactive due to long COVID. The IFS, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, has a slightly different figure, 110,000, and it says that the cost is almost 1.5 billion in lost earnings a year. Another IFS study uh, suggests that um, uh, there is an average of 2.5 hours per worker of sick leave uh, due to those who have long COVID. Either way, the OBR has recognised that the welfare cost of uh, long COVID, uh, of COVID in the, in the round, is around £2.7 billion on welfare um, benefits like incapacity and housing. My Lord, that is an absolutely staggering sum. My Lord, my point is that we can't shrug our shoulders about the impact of conditions like long COVID on the economy. We have to take on the challenge of making this country more healthy and make a pivot towards prevention. <coughs> Andrew Haldane, Chief Executive of the Royal Society of Arts, put it well in his recent speech. We're in a situation for the first time, probably since the Industrial Revolution, where health and well-being are in retreat, he said. Having been an accelerator of well-being for the last 200 years, he added, health is now serving as a break in the rise of growth and well-being for our citizens. And yesterday, Andrew Bailey, the Governor of the Bank of England, told the House of Commons Treasury Committee that part of the reason why the country was being held back was the sharp decline in the size of the workforce since COVID. And yet, despite this, my Lords, the Treasury plan for living with COVID makes no mention of investment in rehabilitation or major initiatives for getting the workforce back to work. Finances in the UK Health Security Agency and the Office for uh, Health Inequalities and Disparities, the, the main legacy uh, uh, public health uh, organisations. Does the noble Lord agree there is a growing concern about the effects of um, booster vaccinations and the serious side effects they can have? And I wonder if he agrees with me that the government should be looking at this very carefully. My Lords, the vaccine programme has been an astonishing success, and the uptake of those vaccines has shown that there is enormous public confidence in our vaccines. And I would speak at another date about what a profound impact that, that has had on the health of the nation. But, my Lord, my points here are that just at the moment when we are feeling very heavily the effects of COVID on our workforce and our economy, the finances at UK uh, uh, HSA and at o um, uh, OHID are under huge pressure. The public health infrastructure built over the pandemic has largely been dismantled. And at the same time, we have a, an NHS straining to look after the sick, and we have a workforce, many of whom are too sick to work. My Lords, by way of conclusion, can I say it is time that we work towards a new political settlement that prioritises the health of the nation and uh, not just the treatment of the sick, and that we make the operational decision in health and care 
to move towards prevention. Baroness Thornton, for bringing this important subject to the House today. Uh, I have a very close relative who has had ME for a number of years now, and I've seen at first hand how debilitating and life-changing it can be. I've become the Vice Chair of the APPG for ME, and I've talked to hundreds of ME patients who have had their condition ignored or ridiculed. They've been subject to inappropriate and sometimes dangerous medical interventions, and I've found them struggling with an employment and benefit system which simply doesn't acknowledge the realities of their condition. Now, those quarter of a million ME patients are now, in effect, being joined by over two million long COVID sufferers. It's worth starting by pointing out that these debilitating post-infection syndromes, like long COVID, are not new clinical en entities. Uh, in American medical literature, there are ME-like symptoms being described as far back as 1934. In this country, when e ME was first noticed, it was described as yucky flu. Yuppy flu, but in fact, these syndromes affect millions of people suffering from a range of viruses right across uh, the, the poor third world countries. The Institute for Fiscal Studies is estimating that one in ten people with long COVID uh, have given up work, and I quote, with persistent labour market effects. In this month's Lancet, they've said post acute infection syndromes could pose a substantial public health burden in the near future if appropriate measures are not taken. And yet, despite the huge economic cost they inflict, as Lord Bethel has said, post-viral illnesses have been neglected, dismissed and under-researched for far too long. And we still have no diagnostic blood tests for either long COVID or ME. As well as the breathlessness, chest pains and loss of taste or smell which characterises long COVID, those patients also exhibit a cluster of symptoms such as debilitating fatigue, post-exertional malaise, cognitive dysfunction, POTS and sleep disturbances that are also diagnostic of ME and other post-infection syndromes. And so while all the funding for research into long COVID must be welcomed, it's disappointing that some researchers are still either ignoring or are simply not aware of what has already been learned about what may be causing ME and how this could help us to understand the causes of long COVID. Almost 40 clinical trials for possible treatments for long COVID have been registered, some involving interventions which have been already assessed in ME. Some of these treatment trials have small sample sizes or have no control groups. And frankly, the lessons don't appear to have been learned from the use of poor quality methodology in many clinical trials involving ME. Some health professionals who are managing people with long COVID are unaware or ignoring what we've learnt about the management of ME and other post-infection syndromes, activity and energy ma management particularly. The ME charity sector is producing excellent information on symptom and energy management, as does the new NICE guideline. But people with long COVID are often simply unaware of this information, as are health, many health workers. Another important lesson that needs to be learned from ME is that misdiagnosis can occur when people with chronic fatigue are not properly assessed and are labelled as having a post-viral syndrome. And there are now some very disturbing cases being reported of people having long COVID when in fact they have another medical condition. A Suffolk councillor recently featured in the news when it turned out that her uh, long-standing diagnosis of long COVID is actually lung cancer. Research into the cause and diagnosis and effective treatments for long COVID could help those with ME, and the ME Association has requested that cl clinical trials for long COVID treatments could include a group with ME. What has been learnt about the management of ME can help many people with long COVID. Harlan Krumholtz, a cardiologist at Yale, said this, no one wanted the pandemic, but sometimes a jolt to the system can create innovation in ways which wouldn't have occurred otherwise. That should be our guiding principle. Yeah. 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 My Lords, I'd like to thank my noble friend Baroness Thornton for initiating this debate. For something which affects up to two million people, I'm concerned about the low level of awareness. 
One person said to me on Monday, does that mean they're still contagious? Also concerned about the economic implications, particularly for the health service uh, and whose staff were on the front line throughout the worst period. My third concern is about continuing government funding for research into long COVID, which my noble friend Baroness Saunton has already raised. On the level of public awareness, is the government satisfied that it's doing enough to raise the profile of the devastating effect of long COVID? Now that the newspapers and media appear to have moved on from covering COVID, the sufferers must feel like the disappeared. I chair the Mesothelioma Oversight Committee, which ensures that payments are made speedily and efficiently to some of those 3,000 people a year who die with mesothelioma. It has a low profile, but at least those diagnosed have the satisfaction of knowing that they and their families will have financial support, thanks to the noble Lord, Lord Freud, when he was the minister. Of course, I'm not claiming that long COVID is a terminal illness for most sufferers. And I'm grateful to Baroness Scott of Needham Market for using the parallel cases yeah. of ME sufferers. Thank you very much for doing that. But awareness, financial support, and funded research are vital in any of these health areas. What plans does the government have to raise awareness and enable families to feel supported. Secondly, on the economic and employment implications, I'm aware that the National Institute for Health and Care Research is doing some research into economic evaluation. But does the noble lord have more information about the impact on health workers, how many and in what areas? Given the number of vacancies in the health service, surely focusing on the recovery of these workers as speedily as possible would pay dividends. The BMA said those doctors who had contracted long COVID had been let down by the government's failure to provide adequate support with staff being faced with a premature return to work, assuming they're physically able, or not being able to pay their mortgages. We know that 2,100 health and care workers lost their lives due to COVID-19, and at least 199,000 National Health Service workers are living with long COVID. They are seven times more likely to have had severe COVID than other workers. And much of this took place with no PPE or inadequate PPE. Temporary staff or locums have already lost their jobs because they didn't have the job security. Does the noble Lord the Minister know how many formal absence procedures have been initiated in the health service and how many have been dismissed due to long COVID? We still do not appear to know the extent of the loss to the labour market and the noble Lord, Lord Bethel has also broached this. The Resolution Foundation stated it could be 600,000. The Institute for Fiscal Studies estimated one in 10. But what is clear is that the majority are not getting enough help. If, if the 600,000 figure is, is correct, and the NHS England data suggests that only 60,000 people suffering from long COVID had been assessed by an NHS specialist service up to August 2022, the gap is concerning and brings us back to awareness and profile. The patient doesn't know they can get help and the GP doesn't recognise the symptoms. Either way, there is a huge job to do and I ask what role does the government have in improving the position? The Chief Executive of the NHS, Amanda Pritchard, said recently, the NHS faces the toughest winter of my career and potentially the toughest winter in its history. 
This does not sound like someone expecting adequate support from the government to me. In the paper, Our Plan for Patients, published by DHSC in September, Therese Coffey said, This government will be on your side when you need care the most. This sounds fine, but there's no reference to long COVID in that paper. Finally, what assurances can the Minister give about governments continuing funding for research? I'm aware the NIHR is conducting 19 studies. I did have uh, a link there 10 years ago as an independent member of one of the subcommittees, but no longer. Many of these pieces of research are still in progress, but some themes are emerging. Mesothelioma was, uh, mesothelioma was under-researched for decades. Will the Minister guarantee this will not happen with long COVID? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, uh, I join in uh, with other noble Lords in thanking the uh, noble Lady Baroness Thornton for having secured this important debate and the very thoughtful way in which she introduced it. In so doing, I declare my own interests as Chair of King's Health Partners uh, and uh, Chairman of UK Biobank and an active researcher in the field of thrombosis, a particular um, pathophysiology that has uh, impacted both acutely in COVID and may have uh, some role uh, in uh, long COVID symptoms. My Lords, we have heard that uh, some 2.1 million people have self-reported as part of the ONS data collection uh, programme uh, symptoms attributable to long COVID. This is some 3.3% of our population. Well, what is striking is that some 500,000 of those individuals report having had uh, COVID some two years uh, previously. Uh, this represents a substantial ongoing chronic burden of disease and something that we should all be uh, very conscious of uh, in terms of the potential impact in the way that we're able to deliver health care through the National Health Service. Uh, little is known, as we have heard, about the uh, etiology of long COVID. There's a suggestion uh, that part of it may be attributable to a failure uh, uh, in some individuals to properly clear uh, the virus uh, from their bodies. It's possible uh, also that uh, there are uh, genetic uh, determinants that drive individual immune response, and that this is, in, in part, this dysfunction is part of the explanation for long COVID symptoms. And then, of course, uh, there is uh, well established now a phenomenon of microvascular and endothelial, the, the cells that line the blood vessel uh, dysfunction, that may be uh, responsible for some of the uh, long COVID symptoms. Uh, indeed, a, a profound uh, hypercoagulable state, a tendency uh, to risk of thrombosis and blood clots, does manifest itself uh, in, a, in an important uh, number of long COVID patients. Uh, we've heard about the importance of research to try and understand more about the etiology of long COVID and indeed better understand its natural history. And that is critically important if we're going to be able to not only uh, research and develop new therapies that uh, will be able to address the question of long COVID by addressing its underlying, uh, the, me the, the mechanisms underlying the development and Sustain, sustain, sustained uh, impact of long COVID. But this research is also critically important in understanding how we should properly develop services to manage patients. At the moment, uh, services, and of course, uh, uh, His Majesty's Government have uh, committed some 194 million uh, to the provision of uh, clinics and services to manage COVID patients, uh, some uh, 90 million to be spent in the financial year 22-23. But when one looks at the burden, uh, this uh, provision of resource is only able to provide services for some 5,000 patients a month. Uh, and if the substantial um, demographic of long COVID is running into many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, clearly we need to understand from prospective research not only what volume of services are needed, but how those should be constructed based on our knowledge of natural history of the disease to adequately and properly uh, manage the requirements of those patients beyond symptom control. Uh, is the noble Lord Minister 
content that the approach that's being taken to research, some 50 million, as we have heard, committed uh, by the Chief Medical Officer to a variety of research programmes, is sufficient. Uh, and indeed, uh, is the noble lord able to address the question uh, raised by uh, Baroness Thornton of why a national cohort has not been established uh, to allow us to uh, marshal the clinical burden that currently exists with regard to uh, long COVID in our country, and then apply an appropriate methodology and appropriate protocols to the evaluation of these individuals. Research <laughs> undertaken in this systematic fashion is not only highly efficient, but provides the best opportunity for us to rapidly understand and start addressing the questions that need to be addressed if we are to develop these new therapies and if we are to organise and deliver services in a way uh, that is most appropriate for these patients. Uh, but beyond, uh, the, of course, the commitment financially to the development of, of uh, a, a long COVID uh, research cohort, uh, there is also the need to ensure that the data collected through routine exposure of these patients uh, to NHS services can be marshalled to inform the research effort, and that those data can link with uh, other data sets that are hugely valuable in our country and have established their value in terms of addressing uh, the question of COVID acutely and in the uh, post-infection period. And I should reiterate my uh, um, interest as, as chairman of UK Biobank, because UK Biobank has been used in that regard. It's a unique resource uh, available to the country, where half a million of our fellow citizens have provided their biological material. Uh, where the uh, genome has now been uh, mapped in those individuals and where uh, the opportunity exists to interrogate the data set using that biological material uh, to assess uh, novel biomarkers and indeed uh, the prevalence of disease uh, and indeed with the uh, deep phenotyping and repeat imaging the capacity to understand structural end organ dysfunction in COVID. All of this requires an approach uh, from His Majesty's Government with regard to data sharing uh, within data sets, across data sets, between researchers uh, in different institutions, and as we have heard, those uh, uh, from outside the public sector wishing to support this research. Uh, is the noble Lord the Minister able to provide a reassurance in that regard? My Lords, I too would like to thank Baroness Thornton for securing this important and timely debate. I'd like to focus my remarks on the rural dimension of long COVID because it's having an impact on many people in Devon where I'm privileged to serve. I'm concerned about rural sustainability and the need to ensure that the government's levelling up agenda is not focused exclusively on urban deprivation. Rural poverty may not show up on government statistics because it's dispersed in pockets, but it's just as real. And in terms of long COVID, research suggests that structural inequalities, including poverty, are important in the development and course of COVID-19 and may form an important context for long COVID. As far as Devon's concerned, the picture postcard view of my county beloved by holidaymakers is only half the story. The best information we have is that there are currently around 16,000 people living with long COVID in Devon. And as I'm sure the noble Baroness Watkins of Tavistock will corroborate, it's impacting on the economic life of our county. As in other parts of the United Kingdom, we know that the group most likely to be affected by long COVID are people between the ages of 35 and 69, women, people living in more deprived areas, those in care, those with a high body mass index, those working in close contact professions, and those living with long-term health conditions. Of the 16,000 people in Devon living with long COVID, only around 17% have been referred to long COVID treatment services. Research has revealed that children and older people, men and those living in deprived areas are less likely to seek help and be referred. The pandemic is, has impacted people's health and self-confidence, well-being, and the demand for services. 
It has had an adverse effect on mental health, with high levels of mental health, anxiety and loneliness. For those suffering from long COVID, unsurprisingly, researchers revealed that they have lower levels of life satisfaction and happiness, and some have lost hope of change or improvement. Overall, the pandemic has had a greater impact on those groups that are already suffering from greater disadvantage and higher health inequities than average across the county. In Devon, service providers have reported increased demand for mental health, domestic violence and drug and alcohol support services. There have also been increased concerns over the safety of children, young people and vulnerable adults. Sadly, young people in Devon reflect the national picture with a significant rise in child obesity during or after the lockdowns, especially among boys and those living in the most deprived communities. And this is something that the noble Lord Doves highlighted in his question earlier this morning. Now, the picture isn't all negative. I'm immensely proud of my county and the resilience of many rural communities much of it, I'm proud to say, fostered and supported by local churches. But one particular concern in Devon is the impact of long COVID on the workforce. National research shows that before contracting COVID-19 and then developing long COVID, two thirds of respondents had been working in frontline jobs such as hospitality, schools, care homes, childcare, emergency services retail, transport and delivery. Most respondents believed that they had almost certainly 41% or very likely 18% caught COVID-19 at work, pointing to the lack of PPE and the direct contact with COVID positive patients. As one researcher commented, key workers are overwhelmingly paying the price of workplace COVID-19 exposure with loss of health, loss of employment and loss of income. My laws, as we move into winter, this is really serious. Now, this national picture is exacerbated in rural counties such as Devon. One of the problems facing the countryside post-Brexit has been the shortage of workers, both in care sector and agriculture. Not only is there a smaller population in rural areas from which workers are drawn, but on average, they have to spend more time travelling to and from their jobs, or in some cases, between jobs. Because long COVID disproportionately impacts lower paid women in frontline roles, this has made it more difficult to recruit suitable staff in the countryside. This shortage is now being seen in many rural businesses in Devon, especially in the hospitality sector, which are closing for the winter period due to lack of staff and higher energy bills. In conclusion, therefore, I'd like to ask the noble Lord, the Minister, what research is being undertaken to assess the medium and long-term effects of long COVID, specifically in rural communities? It's a pleasure to follow the noble uh, prelate Lord. Bishop of Exeter, who I know well and whose speech I completely concur with. Happily, mine doesn't completely reflect it. <laughs> um, I also want to acknowledge Baroness Thornton's um, work in getting this debate for us to consider today. I'm going to particularly highlight the challenges of long COVID on mental health services, healthcare staff, and children's education and health, and therefore need to declare my interests as a registered nurse and president of the Florence Nightingale Foundation. I note that the lack of consistency on the definition of long COVID makes it difficult to measure and analyse the emerging evidence. Despite this, NHSR estimates that 1.8 million people in the UK, and as others have said, 3% of the population are experiencing symptoms of long COVID. Their studies published in 2021 showed up to one in three people who have COVID-19 report long COVID symptoms and up to one in seven children. The scale of chronic ill health and disability after COVID-19 
has been described as the next big global health challenge. I'm not sure it's the next big one. I think it's the immediate one. NIHR's survey of 3,286 people with long COVID, 71% said it was affecting family life, and 80% reported it affected their ability to work. The Ulster University survey of 3,500 healthcare staff demonstrated that 49.3% felt overwhelmed by the pressure of the pandemic, with social work and nursing being the most impacted. The NHS check, a study by King's College London, where I must declare I have a visiting chair, looked at 18 partner NHS trusts, showed high levels of distress and symptoms and anxiety in staff working in healthcare. A concerning finding was that there was a high prevalence of PTSD symptoms and self-harm. This has caused long-term absence of staff due to COVID-related sickness, resulting in those people at work carrying out jobs out of their skill set and or being overworked. It is reported that these issues have directly impacted the quality of care, waiting times and, extre in extreme situations, unsafe practices. Dissatisfied patients have resulted in increased abuse towards healthcare workers, exacerbating their, their exhaustion and anxiety levels. Those on long-term sick leave have suffered isolation and financial difficulties, intensified by the recent soaring costs of living leading to further distress and longer absences from work, and some healthcare workers have lost their jobs due to long COVID. The impact of staff shortages from long COVID has also led to a breach in some patients' human rights, namely the illegal detention of patients. Last week, The Independent reported that mental health patients were being held unlawfully in A&Es due to shortage of staff to undertake timely mental health assessments, I must stress, I believe that that has been to protect their safety, but nonetheless, it's you know, a very severe problem. The effects on our children are highlighted in Ofsted's second report into the impact of the pandemic and school closures. It demonstrates that children have regressed in basic skills, physical fitness and learning, particularly those whose parents were, uh, who were unable to work flexibly, including, of course, health workers. Children were found to show increased signs of mental distress, including a rise in eating disorders and self-harm. Social isolation and greater exposure to family conflicts have added to children's mental ill health, leading to an increase in the number of referrals to CAMS, which has not been matched by an increase in investment to children's services. A large study by the NHS in 2020 found that mental health conditions among children had risen by 50% compared to three years earlier. I think that will be even higher in the next piece of work on that issue. It's very sad that the noble lady, Sally Greengross, isn't here to argue for intergenerational fairness on this mm -hmm. issue. These academic studies have shown major organisational changes across the NHS with substantial physical and mental health challenges for NHS staff themselves during the pandemic and, of course, other care workers. Results also indicate the importance to support staff so that they can continue to, to contribute to service recovery. Therefore, could the noble Lord the Minister explain the Government's position regarding the implementation of the proposed 10-year mental health and well-being plan for NHS staff and in particular, the investment to support staff with long COVID. Will the government make further contributions to NIHR for global collaborative research to increase our understanding of long COVID and its impact? In particular, to generate evidence-based interventions that may enable the health recovery and mental resilience of staff impacted by long COVID and support them to return to work thus ensuring their retention in healthcare practice. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. to take part in today's debate and to make a short contribution. I thank my noble friend Baroness Thornton for having secured the debate. And I think there will be many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people and their families up and down the country 
who will be grateful to her for having given them the opportunity to have their experiences of what we call long COVID both explored and legitimized. And there have been many interesting points made in the debate. I've struck by the noble Lord, Lord Bethel's reference to the economic impact which is staggering, and that's a point to which I will return. Now, that the House may know that there was a debate in the other place about long COVID six months ago, so it's high time we had our own debate here today. Now, the main points I want to make are these. First, that I hope the main outcome of this debate is that we agree on the need for more research into all aspects of COVID, including what we call long COVID. And second, to explore the link that may exist between long COVID and the recent exit from the UK workforce of so many people. Now, of course, I remind the House it was the brilliance of scientific research, including research conducted in this country, that enabled the vaccines to be developed from which we have all benefited. And now we have this challenge of long COVID. One way of thinking about it is to say that it's the persistence of symptoms in those who've had and thought they had recovered from COVID. And it's interesting that the majority of people with long COVID are PCR negative, which indicates microbiological recovery, although the chronic symptoms extend beyond 12 weeks. In other words, long COVID is the time lag between the microbiological recovery and the clinical recovery. Now, um, by May or June last year, some of the most commonly reported symptoms included the following, and I quote, fatigue, coughs, chest tightness, breathlessness, palpitations, myalgia, and a difficulty to focus. And my lords, I'd like to illustrate this with some direct evidence I have received from long COVID sufferers. This person fell ill with COVID in the first wave in 2020. Quote, I was knocked sideways by it. I have never been so ill. I was bedbound for two weeks, coughing badly for two to three months thereafter, feeling weak and frail. Now, my lords, I'd like to introduce your lordships to the concept of brain fog. And I, let me use the words of another sufferer. Quote, brain fog came on insidiously after an initial period of recovery, unaware of it at first, but slowly it engulfed me. I had no name for what was happening to me for a long time. And it was a relief when others started naming it and talking about it. So this is where I think this debate comes in, and it's going to be very helpful for people to know that their symptoms are being recognised. And I've received a, a long list of some of the symptoms, which I'm sure many of your lordships will recognise. The inability to write or concentrate, a short attention span, forgetfulness, memory loss, word lapses, sleep problems, eye problems, balance problems, a terrible sense of brain congestion, quote, sometimes as if my head would split, Exhaustion, weariness, forgetfulness, and others. One said, my vocation is gone and I am unable to write, as though a door had shut in my brain and I cannot work. And another, a desire to flee from company and crowds. I now avoid outings where possible. I am decoupling from life. So I think it's worth the House noting that many of those who suffered from long COVID, of course, did have vaccination and boosters. Um, now, can I just say a word? I understand that some people have taken private action to secure the drug ivermectin. And I've been told that in some cases it had a beneficial effect, albeit for a short time. Now, the reason I mention this is I put questions down to the Minister's Department early this year about this drug, and I would be grateful to know what the Department and the Minister currently, what their view is about this particular drug. Now, this is not the debate in which to refer to the cuts in public expenditure that have been announced by the Chancellor in another place while we've been sitting here. But, of course, cutting back on science research would fatally undermine research efforts. And I hope the Minister will be able to reassure the House today that the Government will protect the £50 million that's been invested in long COVID, as set out by the National Institute for Health Research. And, as I understand it, and I'm grateful to the House of Lords Library for this particular information, um, the NIHR has published its latest theme review entitled Researching Long COVID, Addressing a New Global Health Challenge, in which it refers to three studies considering who gets it and why, two studies looking at the biological causes, three studies are looking at the diagnosis, four studies are evaluating treatments, three studies are considering recovery and rehabilitation, one study is looking at the impact of vaccination, Two studies are looking at how health services can treat the condition and the health and economic cost of the disease. And this brings me to my second major point, which I will have to truncate. What is the link 
between long COVID and the people who have left the workforce. The Office of National Statistics, and reference has been made to this so far, has published several articles, and time does not permit me to give all the details. But um, uh, it is clear that a huge proportion of those in the uh, age bracket of 60 to 65 years are unlikely to return to work, and the pandemic has affected decisions to leave the labour market, and the report published in July 2021 by the ONS listed some of the major reasons that workers cited for not returning. And the research by the Health Foundation indicates that economic activity in the UK has increased by about 700,000 since before the pandemic. This is a huge number, absolutely enormous, and the cost to the UK is going to be very great. Uh, and it seems as though we are living, as it were, my Lord, through a pandemic of inactivity. And the Health Foundation reports, quote, we conclude that these contributing factors are exacerbating a pre-pandemic trend of the increasing prevalence of poor health as a reason for inactivity. So, uh, my Lords, I will end it there. We certainly need more research, and I hope this debate will have what I might call a catalytic effect, uh, both on discussions of long COVID and also on the reply from the Minister. My Lords, I am glad that the noble Baroness Lady Thornton has asked for this debate, and I applaud her comprehensive introduction. When I asked an oral question on this topic on May the 23rd, I quoted a figure of 1.1 million sufferers of long COVID who are unable properly to undertake day-to-day -day activities as a result of their condition. That ONS figure, and this is in the extant library briefing, now stands at 1.6 million. And the total of over 1.1 1 .1 million, 1 .1 million have been suffering for more than one year. This then is a growing problem. Even though we may perhaps be over the worst of COVID as a life-threatening disease, at least for now, a significant minority of those who contract COVID continue to develop long COVID. It is a debilitating illness for the individuals concerned, and its extent represents a wider social problem which the government needs to take seriously. My Lords, many of us know people suffering from this condition, whether professionally or as friends or relatives. My concern in this debate is what can be done better for those who are suffering from their own point of view, and I thank those with long COVID who I have talked to about their situation. My Lords, one friend, under 60, with no discernible underlying conditions and living in rural Hampshire, contracted COVID in September last year. As symptoms persisted, the GP said that she would be referred to a long COVID clinic within two to three weeks. But this only happened 10 months later, with nothing happening in between, and hers is by no means an isolated case. As the Minister will appreciate, this is not just about the waiting time to get to a clinic, crucially important though that is, it's also what happens up to that point. So I ask the Minister what is being done to help upskill all GPs and what can be done as soon as a patient contacts the surgery? What can be done to better signpost the support that a patient requires at an early stage? Indeed, what can be done to ensure that those who have long COVID or suspected long COVID contact a GP in the first place? My friend tells me that ideally the GP should have said stop work completely, I'll fill in a sick note and come back in four weeks and we'll keep an eye on you. And this of course is with hindsight. She believes that if she had been set on the right road from the off, been monitored from the off, she would be much further down the road to recovery. She would also have missed much less work. As it is, over a year later, she can still only do at the most two days of work a week. Her main symptom is fatigue in line with the 70% of the 1.6 million I have quoted. This is not just about not being able to climb a hill, it is about not having any, any energy to do anything for a period of time. Of course, many people stop reaction to this, sufferers and non-sufferers alike, is carry on regardless, try to take more exercise. One very good reason why long COVID should be treated professionally as quickly as possible. My Lords, an additional point, is that addressing these concerns will avoid in toto a significant loss to the economy, as others have already pointed out. The Government needs to take a significant note of that. My Lords, there needs to be faster access to long COVID clinics, as Baroness Thornton has said. 
there is clearly still a postcode lottery about referral. Many more clinics need to be put in place across the whole of the UK, both to decrease waiting times and ensure everyone has the same level of access, which continues to vary hugely across the country. Fortunately, my friend now has a case manager, a qualified physiotherapist who can refer her to different services according to the symptoms displayed, and we know there are a multitude of symptoms exhibited by sufferers. So there is the respiratory team, the occupational therapy team, and so on. The problems don't stop there, though, in terms of delivery, because there are also difficulties in accessing these, those services, as has already been pointed out. I asked the Minister whether that can be looked at, as well as the priorities over access and the funding involved for long COVID patients. One good thing is my friend's case uh, in, in my friend's case, is that meetings with her case manager are all through Zoom. Travelling itself is very difficult for long COVID patients. My Lords, such is the demand for treatment and the slowness of NHS provision that there are now heavily subscribed private online programmes of treatment. People are desperate, but there is a question over, over whether these services are a substitute for those services referred through the NHS as, of part as part of what ideally should be a complete and integrated programme of recovery. And I, that is, uh, I, I, know I say this really as an open question. My Lords, in an informative video on YouTube, one sufferer, Jez Medinger, sums up what many sufferers experience when he says, I quote, it takes every aspect of your life and pretty much crushes it. The government needs to do as much as possible to support those with long COVID as well as putting money into research to beat this condition. Lord, I'm uh, grateful to my noble friend, uh, Baroness Thornton, for um, a masterly introduction to this debate. And uh, I must say, I'm, I'm speaking with a little trepidation because I'm no authority in this area. <laughs> but I recognise very quickly that what Lord Conquer had to say and, and his uh, request to the government particularly about uh, the uh, need for a national cohort is very important indeed and if I learn nothing else today and I hope if the government does nothing more today it will at least respond to that. Um, I approach this from, from an unusual angle in that at the beginning uh, when uh, Covid started, you may recall, Noble Lords may recall, every day on the BBC we had photographs of the people who were dying. Um, from that, I observed that they were mainly old. Secondly, there was a preponderance of men rather than women. Thirdly, um, there was um, a proportionately uh, higher number from the BAME uh, population in the UK. And fourthly, uh, of which 50% of those dying um, were overweight. Uh, and this is the subject that uh, my noble friend Baroness Thornton knows I've laboured on uh, for, for a long time. Um, so I noticed that, and then uh, others were noticing, we then had the research findings which bore out uh, that there was a categorisation in this form um, the actual research backed it up. Um, so we then saw the government decided he had to do something about obesity and very quickly indeed moved to produce its uh, uh, 2001 strategy um, as these underlying causes were contributory factors in, in a substantial way. Um, now we had higher death rates in the UK than in the rest of Europe. Um, we had a high number that died. We were leading the field with the numbers for a period. Well, they have put me right if I'm wrong, but I, I think we performed particularly poorly. We did extraordinarily well with the vaccines, yes, but the death rate was very high indeed. And we're generally seen as having one of the unhealthiest nations in Europe. And part of that factor does go back to, to obesity, uh, again linked with COVID. Uh, one of the factors I've tried to establish, and I must confess I've not read 
the, the uh, COVID occupational impacts. I've just glanced at it. Um, but there is uh, some important information there that relates to the BMA com community, uh, which uh, sheds light on, on the problem there. But what I cannot find out is whether there are any common factors in a substantial scale that you can identify within people who have got long-term COVID. For example, I know people who have got long-term COVID and they're overweight. They were overweight before, so they had an underlying cause, they were at risk, and they continue now with long-term COVID, yet they have a problem with their weight. It continues. I know this is a difficult subject, but we need to address it honestly and straightforwardly. And if, in fact, there are continuing underlying factors which are not dissimilar to the problem in the first instance, we need to acknowledge it, we need to look at it, and we need to give support and assistance in those areas and not run away from some of the difficulties which may be around. As we run away so much in this country these days and from some of our underlying problems that we have, that it is, it is too difficult politically and sensitively to address them on a straight head-on basis. So um, I'm speaking I'm marginally out of tone with the rest of the debate, but with all the compassion, um, I do have compassion just as much, but I believe it's important we have a frank debate and an honest debate on this topic, and uh, I express my gratitude again to my colleague for uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, uh, speak openly and to have a full debate on the topic that's before, because it's a very big one and it may be repeated elsewhere with other issues that come along later. Uh, so I would be grateful if the Minister might tell us whether we're performing badly compared with the rest of Europe. We're getting more cases with long COVID than elsewhere. I wanted to know whether, in fact, we are doing better research or less than elsewhere in Europe. I pick up from Lord Bethel that, in fact, the evidence indicates that we're leading the field in the research, and that's good. But I believe, fundamentally, we still have to keep coming back all the time to prevention in the first instance. And until we make and seek to make our country healthier, we will not be in a position to meet up to all the problems that will come with climate change and so on, new diseases and, and uh, issues that arise uh, unforeseen. But if we're healthier and able to come face it, uh, we stand a much better chance of doing better next time round than we've done before and not have so many people left over with a continuing illness in the way that we have at the moment. My Lords, Baroness Masham of Wilton is taking part remotely and I invite Baroness Masham to speak. My Lords, I apologise for having to be virtual this week. My Lords, I would like to thank Baroness Thornton for this debate in a very special thank you. My Lords, I am a member of the All Party Both Houses Group on Coronavirus. On several occasions, we have taken evidence on long COVID. On, one la on the last occasion, three ladies gave us evidence. One a doctor, the other a teacher, and the third a train driver. All would like to be working, but it was impossible as long COVID had struck them so badly and they were unable to leave their houses and fatigue and brain fog took over their lives. My Lords, one of the ladies said, we are the forgotten. I said, no, you are not forgotten. That is why my thank you to the Baroness Thornton for having this debate is so special. My Lords, recently I met a doctor at a BMA dinner doing research on long COVID in Birmingham. I asked him how he found long COVID and he wrote to me stating, I have been reflecting on the challenges I'm facing in both my role as a clinician and researcher in long COVID. One of the biggest issues for me personally is the definition 
of long COVID. It is necessarily broad, given that we do not fully understand it, but it includes such a heterogeneous group of patients that the diagnosis has limited use for patients. As a result, it is very difficult to design studies to understand it better. Funding for special research to address this would benefit the community greatly. Pragmatically, my experience for the long COVID services has been good, though I should emphasize I only have experience with one center and I'm fully aware that across the country, services are patchy. We have been fortunate locally to have rehabilitation experts who have joined the team and made a positive contribution. My Lords, services are patchy across the country and so many health issues, people living in rural areas should not be forgotten as was stated by the Right Reverend Bishop of Exeter. My Lords, our APBPG on coronavirus key messages are, long COVID is having and will continue to have a significant impact on both the UK's health and economy. COVID-19 must be recognized as an occupational disease. A compensation scheme must be put in place for key workers now living with long COVID. There must be a comprehensive long COVID care system established in order to tackle the significant burden long COVID will continue to place on the NHS. My Lords, long COVID does and will continue to significantly impact the UK population. This includes having a significant impact on the UK workforce and both public and private sectors. Many of these living with the acute health challenges presented by long COVID were initially infected as a result of work they did during the pandemic on the front line, caring for patients, educating children, and continuing to provide vital transport services. Yet support from employers and indeed the state is hugely variable. My Lords, APPG has heard of the devastating impact long COVID has on children. Long COVID can have a significant impact on children's education as a result of lost learning and the level of support offered by schools to parents of pupils living with long COVID and their pupils is extremely variable. The APBG has heard that children experience a wide range of long COVID symptoms and that these symptoms can differ from their dis displayed in adults. Yet there remains little research into treatment of specific care pathways for children. Without such research, long COVID will continue to impose impact on the health and education of children living with long COVID. My Lords, it seems to me that there should be guidance on long COVID, which goes out from the government across the country for GPs, employers, both private and public services and public at large. Some GP surgeries do not want to be involved, but patients only want Can to I just know remind the, the noble lady. The Can I just remind the they noble lady of the six minute speaking time, please? I've just about finished. They need directions not to feel forgotten and not worth advising. Would the minister agree? My Lords, 
I end by saying we need compassion that this difficult time across the country to solve the mystery of why some people de de develop long COVID and others receive without complications and taking the similarities of ME into consideration. My Lord, thank you. My Lords, um, I would like to begin by not just thanking uh, my noble friend, Baroness Thornton, for making this debate available to us, but uh, for um, her having demonstrated stamina beyond the normal in the way she's fronted for this side of the House and I think spoken for members across the House through the entire uh, troubles that we've been through with COVID. Uh, COVID may have a long form, but those who speak about it and remind us of its importance can also have a long form. And so I'd like to thank her for that. And also I'd like to pay tribute to um, our friends in, in the library for their briefing note, which is truly extraordinary and has been mined by many of us in the speeches we've made. My Lords, uh, the noble lady, Baroness Scott of Needham Market, has drawn attention to the way that ME uh, played out um, through chapters of misapprehension um, and wicked um, neglect uh, through its course until we got onto more certain ground. I might add dyslexia as another condition which suffered from not having adequate analysis um, or a forensic understanding and led to its own uh, misapprehensions. And all that leads me to um, focus my uh, intervention um, on the first of Baroness Thornton's points, um, the need for data, the need for an adequate basis from which to draw uh, empirical and helpful conclusions. And uh, that um, in pressing the government, and certainly she's not the only one who's who's done this, uh, we must just uh, almost insist, if that's within the bounds of the convention of this House, that the government really give us an answer on that one. Uh, how do we get the empirical basis, the evidential basis, upon which we can draw um, reasonable... And I did hear, with the noble Lord, Lord Kakar, not in his place just at the moment, uh, the suggestion that there were concrete ways of responding available, perhaps, they may be, then it may be, need to be enriched and the rest of it, but for all of that, it's urgent that we have that evidential base, for this is something we must know more about and know more about it scientifically. Um, I have a son um, who went down with all the symptoms that uh, my noble friend um, Viscount Stansgate mentioned uh, and for months and months and months was, was laid flat out. Um, he has made a good recovery. Um, so that's a possibility, but I have to say that his family live with the possibility that it may recur. And again, that emphasizes the need for um, understanding this disease better than we do currently. I have to say for my son, and a father would only want to do this, that in his recovery he played a key part in the way that the funeral of the late Queen played out, uh, because he works for city, uh, the Westminster City Council responsible for their street management. He resourced the queues and uh, cleaned the streets once the horses had left their hallmark and did all the things that run unseen. So I do want to say that, but I have another son who hasn't had COVID, but COVID has had him. He has a small business which collapsed the day lockdown started and he's reinventing himself all the time. Long COVID in an economic and personal way, um, not related to the disease in the bloodstream or whatever it is, but playing itself out in as insidious a way. The economic outcomes have to be borne in mind. And a daughter who lives um, in, in France, um, whose marriage didn't survive lockdown. And once again, those sorts of things happen as a consequence of COVID and are ongoing realizations that we have to cope with and deal with as best we can. So long COVID in, in its clinical 
um, uh, phase of operation and understanding, um, together with long COVID in the outcomes in personal and in economic life, um, need all to be held together. But one thing is certain in my mind, as I draw my remarks to a close, is that, um, as the noble Baroness began by saying, COVID is still with us. And the worry is that we might, um, uh, it might recur when we thought we'd cracked it. I have to say, on a lighter note, uh, that um, I went down with it once, with very mild symptoms, but on my significant birthday, when I couldn't finish my salmon steak or my glass of wine. So I have a real grudge against <laughs> COVID, and I hope that that will be taken into consideration as well. <laughs> My Lords, I too want to applaud Baroness Thornton for bringing forward this incredibly important debate and also for her outstanding uh, introduction. Long Covid is undoubtedly a serious challenge for the NHS and, as uh, Lord Bethel said, for the economy and also a devastation for about one and a half million people across the country. My principal reason for speaking in this debate is a concern that, for reasons I simply do not understand, the chronic fatigue syndrome, which too often results from the COVID virus, is not linked in doctors' minds, or indeed in many other minds, to the chronic fatigue syndrome, which can be triggered by other viruses, and from which more than one and a half million people suffer and have suffered for many years. The principal symptom of chronic fatigue, as we know, whether it's triggered by COVID or some other virus, is extreme physical and mental tiredness, and that that does not go away with rest or sleep. Sufferers find it difficult to carry out everyday tasks and activities, and as others have mentioned, too often they cannot work. But this applies to the one and a half or more million people, as I say, with chronic fatigue who've had it for, for however long, for in many cases for years, and to people with chronic fatigue from COVID. COVID. Exactly the same. Other symptoms, as other noble lords have, have mentioned, may or may not include muscle or joint pain, headaches, flu-like symptoms, or feeling dizzy or sick. COVID-triggered triggered chronic fatigue may also include, include a loss of taste and smell. And I think this is the slightly misleading little piece of the jigsaw. In the main, chronic fatigue triggered by COVID and chronic fatigue triggered by another virus are indistinguishable other than this rather weird thing about loss of taste and smell. But has the Minister any evidence to suggest that these two chronic fatigues, chronic fatigue from COVID, chronic fatigue from other viruses, are in any way distinct, other than in this little piece, which I think is just a separate element of the consequence of COVID? As someone has, uh, who has asthma for the rest of my life as a result of COVID, I also experienced a complete loss of taste or smell for several months after COVID. And I'm not just being self-indulgent. <laughs> there is a point to bring this, put this in. It seems clear to me that the loss of taste and smell following COVID should be regarded as separate from chronic fatigue and separate from asthma or any other COVID, post-COVID illness. The fact that post-COVID chronic fatigue sufferers may lose their taste and smell should not, in my view, suggest that post-COVID chronic fatigue is in any way different from other post-viral chronic fatigue syndromes. They're surely identical, and medical treatment and research should, in my view, focus on all types of chronic fatigue syndrome, including COVID-related CFS. We know there have been a huge, uh, uh, um, there have been a lot of, there has been a lot of money devoted to research because of long COVID. It is, in my view, crazy for that research, that money, that research, not to include other forms, of other causes, if you like, of chronic fatigue. It, it just can't, can't be right somehow. So I very strongly welcome the noble Lord, Lord Bethel's focus on the alarming economic consequences of long COVID. And of course, again, the economic consequences of chronic fatigue, whether triggered by, chronic, by COVID or any other virus, are eye-wateringly large. And again, <laughs> urgent attention, both medical and also in research, should be given to the prevention and treatment of chronic fatigue, however it is triggered. I raise this issue in part 
um, because in the past, CFS sufferers, chronic fatigue sufferers, uh, have, have really experienced the most unpleasant stigma from doctors and others who tended to take the view that chronic fatigue is actually, in no sense, a physical illness. It's just something in the mind. Clearly, post-COVID CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, is acknowledged to be a physical response to COVID with a deeply unpleasant set of symptoms. It would be very helpful if the same understanding were applied to CFS triggered by other viruses or events. I'll be grateful if the Minister can respond to this point and also to Lord Bethel's important economic concern in his summing up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my Lords, I join those who congratulate and indeed thank my noble friend for introducing this debate. And I'm sure that she is very pleased with the expertise that we've had in the House today, uh, which shows the kind of contribution uh, we can make to furthering issues of this kind. Um, I'm not an expert in any way on, on health matters, but it has been striking how significant the big picture is of the problems that actually face everyone, and we should all be aware of the difficulties that are being created here. I mean, the estimates that we've heard about, be it two million or more, because that's self-reporting, uh, mean that this is a very significant problem, both for individuals who are affected, but also for society and, indeed, as Lord Bethel was saying, the e economy as a whole. It seems to me that long COVID affects the individual, but it affects their family, their friends, their employment, society as a whole, and, indeed, the economy, as we have heard. And I think the case that we've heard about uh, this afternoon do show the extent and the range of the problems that are actually involved. And I was struck by the BBC today talking about uh, a young girl in the North East who had missed virtually two years of education uh, because of long COVID, which obviously <laughs> affected the whole of her family. And we've heard today about key workers in particular who have really had their lives turned upside down by this, which has been difficult for them as individuals and their family, but is a great loss to all of us if they are not in the National Health Service and participating as, as key workers. And the fact that many are not able to return to work is a very significant problem for us all. Um, I listened to what was being said about medical research, and I think we were all very struck by what Lord Kaka said, and uh, hope the Minister can accept that that is a particular way forward. But if we're talking about the impact on the economy and society, I do want to pick up what Baroness Thornton said about the need for employers to have better guidance on how they should actually react. And I would like to know more about what is happening here because we are suffering uh, very significant s skill shortages in many areas which are holding back our economic uh, progress. And the fact that individuals vary in how they uh, are affected by long COVID is something that needs to be more widely understood. You know, the fact that somebody may be okay one day but not the next is not easy for employers to, to deal with. And I think that the need for greater flexibility in terms of employment is important, but also coordination across government. Um, turning to the impact on individuals, I do think that the situation seems to be extremely uh, varied. Um, early on, there was probably a lack of understanding by medics and everybody, but I think that many people who suffer from long COVID, as was being said on other illnesses, do find uh, that doctors vary, medics vary generally in their understanding. And some people feel it's very difficult to be taken seriously uh, for problems of this kind. Um, the idea of uh, a post-COVID assessment service is clearly very welcome. But when we hear that over a third of the people who need that service have to wait for several months, and that's not months since they first got COVID, it's months since they first realised that there was a longer-term problem. So I think that we 
do need to get a grip of that uh, difficulty. Um, I think the uh, bishop referred to someone uh, to, to issues in his areas where only 17% of people were getting access. The, the problems of postcode lottery in any area of health is a problem, and it's certainly a problem here, as is the difficulty that sometimes arises with statutory sick pay, because not all people are entitled to it. People do tend to go back to work because they've no option, because they need the money, and that can lead to longer-term problems in, in the end. So I think we need some better coordination on the part of government in order to make sure um, that everybody is covered in the way that it is. So I've actually got two particular points I want to raise with the Minister. One is the fact that COVID isn't over, and I do worry about the complacency that I think is settling in on this issue. Mention was made that in the early days it was on the media all of the time. Now it's hardly ever mentioned and people are not coming forward for vaccinations as much as they should. And we don't know what the next variant's going to be or when that's going to hit us. And I think the government has got to be prepared to step up its game to make sure that we don't become uh, too complacent. But the other point I would make to the Minister is that the current Chancellor of the Exchequer was chair of the Health Select Committee. And if he looks at the tweets and the statements by Jeremy Hunt when he had that role, he will find many quotes that the department can use to get leverage for extra funding in this area. So I do recommend that he does his homework on the present <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I think his department might find that very useful. Yeah. <laughs> My Lord, I declare an interest as Chair of UCLA H. University College London Hospitals Foundation NHS Trust, Chair of Whittington Health NHS Trust and a member of the Integrated Care Board for North Central London, as well as other interests stated on the register. And I'm most grateful to the noble lady Baroness Thornton, a wonderful fellow non-executive director at Whittington Health, for securing this debate. I too am very grateful to the Library, who have been hugely helpful, and I'm enormously grateful to all other speakers, because I think most of you have said most of what I was going to say. <laughs> now, I have a very specific point. At UCLH, we run a well-known, much-admired long COVID service, and it's led by the remarkable Melissa Heitman, who's also the National Specialty Advisor uh, for NHS England and the co-chief investigator for the Stimulate ICP study, which is the, longest, uh, which is the largest long COVID trial to date. Now, we know that the service is desperately needed. We've heard that all around the House. Those who run this particular service are working night and day. It doesn't have the resources to do what's needed, to the extent that those who run it are begging for bits of resource for el from elsewhere, mostly but for people. And so short is the service of staff that they recently asked the University College London Hospital's charity to fund an extra consultant for two years, which it's agreed to. I'm well aware, as we all are, that today is the day of the autumn financial statement and that times are tough. But it is really serious when a one billion turnover NHS trust mm -hmm. has to ask its charity to support an on-the-ground service led by the national lead, even for a limited period of time, and particularly for a service which is designed to help other NHS staff across London. Worse still, and other noble lords have said this, some 10 to 14 per cent of the reported case are in fact NHS staff. Although we all know that, it's not generally known amongst the population, but it's not really surprising given the higher exposure to the virus that they all had. What a difference getting them well and back to work would make, both to the cash-strapped NHS and the staff numbers challenged NHS, because we have real trouble in recruiting. And of course, as others have said, we have people leaving the service. In its latest... In intervene, Noble Baroness. Uh, can I just personally endorse what the Noble Baroness just said, in particular her testimony on Melissa Heitman and the team at UCLH, who I had extensive dealings with as a minister. Their work is absolutely first class, and I am heartbroken to hear that they are having to reach to charity for financial support. 
I'm extremely grateful to the noble lord, and I, I will make sure that Melissa knows about that. Um, meanwhile, we, of course, have all the figures that everybody has quoted, uh, but the ONS has reported that long COVID has adversely affected the day-to-day -day activities of 1.6 million people. That is absolutely huge, and others have mentioned that. Now, the NHS has tried to help with this ongoing issue. Unfortunately, not enough. And I just want to go through that because I think it's relevant. In October 2020, NHS England announced a five-point plan to support long COVID patients. It commissioned NICE to develop new guidance, and it established designated long COVID clinics to provide joined-up care for physical and mental health. I quote. It also created the NHS Long COVID Task Force to guide the NHS's national approach on long COVID, and it funded NIHR research on long COVID to better understand the condition. In July 2021, NHS England published its Long COVID Plan for 21-22, which included investing £70 million to expand Long COVID services and £30 million in the rollout of an enhanced service for general practice to support patients in primary care. But when NHS England published its updated plan in July this year, the previously enhanced service funding wasn't continued, so primary care no longer receives any ring-fenced funding for this condition, and yet, as we know, it affects nearly two million people. The problem is both insufficient resources to do all of the work that's needed and insufficient forward planning to enable those services that do exist to build up capacity, engage in research, recruit, train, educate and care for patients, including, importantly, the large number of NHS staff who appear to have been affected. My Lords, we have a major health problem here likely to run for many years. Treatment is uneven across the country. Research, which is going to need a lot of funding, is in its early days. This is an additional burden on an already very stretched NHS, both with patients with long COVID and with the large numbers of staff. So what we really need is a properly NHS Executive Commission service to be put in place now with secure funding for the next several years, even in these cash-strapped times. It feels like a hand-to-mouth, temporarily funded arrangement, so it's really hard to build a resilient service for the longer term. Can the Noble Lord the Minister assure this House that such long-term commissioning will now be put in place, given the recent evidence of the numbers of people away from work with long COVID, the huge proportion of NHS staff affected, making other NHS backlog issues worse, the general impact on the UK economy, which others have mentioned, and, of course, the sheer suffering that long COVID is causing. In the warm congratulations to my noble friend, both for securing this debate and for the way in which she introduced it. But she and other noble lords will know that by the time you get to this stage of a debate, there isn't much new to say. Um, but I have been listening very carefully, and there's no doubt that there's a great deal of agreement about the fact that this long COVID prov uh, pr provides a new challenge for already much challenged health sector. And there seem, in listening to the excellent speeches that have been made, three main problems about long COVID. There's the issue of recognition and awareness, there's the issue of treatment, and there's the issue of its impact. The first problem seems to be knowing whether you have long COVID or not. The same could be said of COVID itself, actually. When I tested positive for COVID last year, no one was more surprised than I. I thought I had a little head cold and was astonished to find when I was tested here at your Lordship's house that I was positive. I know many people had the same experience. And this very uncertainty, have I got long COVID or not, adds to the anxiety of sufferers. Just this morning, I was speaking to a young man in his 30s who had such awful brain fog, as he called it, after getting long COVID, that he actually thought he had senile dementia coming on. Um, I'm glad to say he's now recovering. This also applies to treatment. There seems to be no agreed accepted programme of treatment for long COVID sufferers, and availability of treatment is patchy in the extreme. In many areas, it seems to depend on the chance of finding a sympathetic doctor or nurse. 
Uh, and if you had symptoms for four plus weeks, that's supposed to be an indicator, but it's not always accepted that these are the same symptoms. And are they always present, as, as we've heard uh, many noble lords mention? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any agreement about that, and of course we are all reminded of the experience of ME, which noble baronesses have brought to our uh, attention, uh, when uh, many of, of those who were suffering uh, for many years what was called yuppie flu and seen as the last resort of malingerers, causing much distress to sufferers. And that brings me to the impact of lung COVID, uh, and much has been said about its effect on the labour and employment market. Uh, the IF, uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies has been quoted by many uh, that, that said that long COVID had shown some persistent labour market effects, with impacts being felt at least three months after in infection, at least. I remind your Lordships that we must consider these possible effects on the ability to work in the light of the terrible workforce problems which many local, lo, uh, noble lords have mentioned, particularly in the health and social care sector. There are nearly 170,000 vacancies in social care alone already, and so many people are burnt out and leaving the workforce. And if long COVID further affects these shortages, as seems likely, we must be fearful of the ability of the NHS and social care to provide even the minimum care which citizens have a right to accept. As others have said, the need for further research and for action as a result of the search already commissioned is urgent. I must draw your attention to the particular problems faced by unpaid carers in this regard. Uh, we all know that many carers have been extremely careful with the poss possibility of catching COVID and have been shielding for much longer than the general population so they don't pass it on to the person they care for. From a benefits perspective, people with a new illness such as long COVID who are of state pension age must have evidenced health needs for six months before they can even claim attendance allowance. So, so the cost of being impaired by long COVID will not be offset for this group or for their carers. Um, in, as one carer said, my husband may not be able to return to work due to long COVID. So the loss of half the mon monthly income, coupled with the rise of everything from fuel to heating costs and a new baby will be devastating for us as a household. Or one carer who themselves had long COVID said, I'm a carer who has long COVID and I'm on a long waiting list to get help. I've been told I will most likely have to wait for nine or 10 months before my initial appointment. I asked for my situation as a carer to be taken into consideration, but I was told this was not considered as a circumstance that would merit any special consideration. My Lords, this is not acceptable. There is no doubt that long COVID is having a negative impact on our nation, especially on the, the, on the most vulnerable in our nation. We must take it seriously. We must give support in benefits, in the benefit system, in practical support, and in thinking in long-term policy about how this is going to affect us in the future. I hope the minister will be able to confirm that the government is committed to many of the things which have been called for today. Better diagnosis, better collection of data, more consistent messaging, and above all, an understanding of the wide-ranging impact of long COVID on the health, both physical and mental, of our whole nation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my Lords, I declare my interest as a Vice Chair of the All-Party Group on Coronavirus. And I also want to add my congratulations to Lady, Lady Thornton uh, for securing this important debate. And she and I have spent most of the last 30 months in the parliamentary trenches of emergency COVID legislation statements and questions, along with Lord Bethel and uh, more recently Lord Kamal. Uh, Lord Markham doesn't know how lucky he is to have missed those times. Um, but Lady Thornton's speech absolutely eloquently set out the issues. Uh, and I thank, want to thank the organisations, including the library, that have sent in briefings. And for everyone who has spoken so far in this debate, very many powerful contributions from all around your house. And despite Lady Pitt-Keithley's worries that there was nothing left to say, she certainly said many things, and including different things, and it's a pleasure to follow her. My Lords, I want to start by taking us back 100 years. 
the excellent book Pale Rider by Laura Spinney, which both Lady Thornton and Lord Bethel have heard me quote from repeatedly, shows evidence of excess deaths throughout the late 1920s and 30s after everyone thought the Spanish flu epidemic was over. But no one made the connection. All that they knew was that there was an excess death in cardiac and respiratory disease over a decade period. Now, of course, we understand more. So I want to start with a key question for the noble lord, the minister. It's already evident to me that parts of the NHS and many parts of government want to put COVID behind them. Will he undertake to make sure that we do not repeat history and stop learning from COVID because it is not yet over, as others have said? Lord Kaka's authoritative and expert contribution uh, uh, earlier today uh, was really helpful. The scientific world is now publishing papers that show the consequences of COVID after that initial infection period. One in 22 will have a major cardiac event within 12 months of having caught COVID. One in five will get long COVID. As we've heard, that's up to over 2 million people to date. COVID damages the brain. Last week, a friend of mine in their 70s, who he and his wife thought had got rapid onset dementia, I mean, very bad rapid onset dementia, discovered after an MRI scan it was not dementia at all, but many, many microclots in his brain, which were definitely affecting his capacity to think, speak, and to physical, uh, do physical things. That is going to be with him now for the rest of his life. It damages the vascular system. It damages the immune system. And variants mean that herd immunity and even one course of vaccines are no long-term solution. Amongst studies published recently uh, is one from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And one American commentator, a scientist, says, we don't know everything about long COVID yet, but what we do know is downright terrifying. But you'd never know it if you don't seek out that information for yourself. The pandemic is a mass killing and a mass disabling event, and long COVID is going to be a defining issue of our time. The Americans do have a reference system. The US Veterans Association provides a longitudinal study for COVID, and an article in Nature published in May showed that long COVID um, uh, after breakthrough SARS COVID infection has considerable evidence of further and long term problems. And the more often you get COVID, the more likely you are to get long COVID or other serious consequences. The Right Reverend Prelate referred to health inequalities in rural areas, and Lord Brooke also referred to health inequalities for people get catching COVID. Interestingly, this was also a major problem in the Spanish flu 100 years ago, and also that long tail 100 years ago. We have learned nothing. My noble friend, Lady Scott of Needham Market, made a strong and impassioned argument for not falling into the trap of assuming that long COVID is about weakness and also about psychology. There are still no blood tests to identify long COVID or ME. And she and Lady Meacher made the vital connection with other post-viral conditions. Researchers this week um, are now are seeking volunteers with long COVID to take part in a study that is looking at psychological factors, full stop. Psychological factors, full stop. My lords, after, breath, after all the evidence we've had this morning, breathtaking. If you haven't seen it already, um, Roland Manthorpe, the excellent technology correspondent of Sky News, has a long article on the Sky website about his two-year journey with long COVID. It's very moving including people saying he just needed to start doing things gently and build up, not the answer. <laughs> Earl Clancarty also spoke of the difficulties in accessing appropriate support with GPs. This point, the questions that others have asked about definitive research becomes really important. But not just the research, it's ensuring that the training for all our frontline healthcare and clinical staff understands that and that they don't stick by the old thoughts. Lord Brooke of Alverthorpe spoke about the high numbers of deaths in the UK, and this was principally thought to be due to late lockdown in the first big wave, if you look at the excess deaths. And comorbidities was an absolute key point. It wasn't just obesity, but it, obesity was amongst them. 
but significantly people with high blood pressure, people with a history of heart problems, people with asthma also faced high death rates as well. Long Covid definitely affects children too. My noble friend Lady Harris of Richmond, who cannot be in her place today, has spoken often in your Lordship's House about the devastating effects that long Covid can have on children from familial experience. Lady Taylor referred to a young girl from the North East and her two-year experience of long Covid. And yesterday, Hayden from Elvington in Kent, a previously fit and healthy 15-year-old, told the BBC how his life has completely changed after he caught COVID in December 2020. He used to swim, play judo, but now has to use a wheelchair and is largely bedridden, with, amongst other things, extreme and severe fatigue. Viscount Stansgate referred to Ivor Mechtim. I think that's a longer debate for another day, but I strongly recommend he reads the one-pager that you can find online by a scientist who explains why it should not be used in humans at all. In vitro, possibly, possibly even cows, but not in humans. Uh, my Lords, the employment issues are absolutely vital. The Right Reverend Prelate referred to employment stats in Devon. And the all-party group on coronavirus also found statistics too. The big issues that seemed to affect employees were that COVID-19 was often first contracted in the workplace, especially prevalent, as we've heard, in professions which were deemed to be key and essential workers. And as Lady Neuberger said, 10% of those are in healthcare. So it is really shocking that the NHS is now sacking staff with long COVID. And when those staff say, but I caught it at work, the NH say, you can't prove it, end of case. That's happened to a friend of mine who is a senior midwife and it's appalling. She is now lost to the profession. The all party group has received many examples of healthcare professionals who were forced to work with COVID-19 positive patients with inadequate PPE. We've also heard from employers forcing them to work in unsafe conditions and offering no support to return to work, and a growing trend that those with long COVID feel physically and mentally unable to challenge dismissals or wrong PIP allocations. That's a real problem, my Lords, because it means they're not getting benefits to which they are entitled. Lady Thornton set out the medical problems, and I want to raise another issue. A number of education secretaries over the last 30 months have continued not to take account of COVID and long COVID in schools. And that's why we have so many children with long COVID. So why aren't we following the example of America where all children are eligible for the vaccine? Um, a colleague of mine, um, Councillor Oliver Patrick in Somerset, has devised a very cheap ventilator for children's classrooms because the, you only need one of them. It costs about £100 to create. But schools are not getting support to do that. And certainly the word is not getting around. So when we have the next wave expected in January, February, schools will act once again as a vector for COVID. And arising out of that will be long COVID. My Lords, um, can I finish by asking the Minister some questions, some of which have already been started? The we need guidelines for employers, both private and public sectors, about how they manage uh, employees who have had COVID. Will the government undertake a compensation scheme available to all frontline key workers who have got COVID? Will he look at the care system, as Lady Keithley outlined? Will the government look at measuring, reporting and monitoring the number of people, including children, with long COVID in the UK? And finally, my Lords, as Lady Watkins said, um, and Baroness Taylor, long COVID is a key part of COVID. Until the long COVID tale is over, COVID is not over. Will he undertake to sh make sure that government acts by that? Before I start, I'd like to refer, to, uh, refer my Lords to the, my register of interests. My Lords, I would first like to thank the noble Baroness, Lady Thornton, for securing this important debate, and all noble Lords across the Chamber for their thoughtful and considered contributions. I will try and do uh, their points justice in, in my response, um, but uh, where I don't, I, I promise to follow up in, in, in writing. 
Uh, the pandemic has tested us all in many ways, as I'm sure the noble lords will agree. <coughs> Governments and healthcare systems around the world are all facing the same set of challenges in tackling long COVID. Although I am to some extent still the new guy, I am under no illusions about how these add to the existing challenges facing the NHS, some of which have been already debated <coughs> in the chamber. We have done much already, and I shall not pretend that we have got it all right. We, we must, of course, do more, as, as well put by my former colleague, uh, Lord Bethel, and, and, and many others today. Today's debate has been a wide-ranging one. I will do my best to respond on the issues raised. I will set out what the Government is doing on the serious challenges of long COVID, such as NHS healthcare, research, employment and social support. However, with the presence in this House of so many of the key players in the fight against COVID, Lord Bethel, uh, Lord Darcy, uh, Lord Stevens, um, I think it's only right that we first recognise the critical role that they all played and uh, support they gave in the unprecedented global challenge that uh, we faced and how um, the country acted decisively. And I think we would broadly agree got the big calls right, being the first country to administer an approved vaccine, the first to administer a bivalent vaccine together uh, uh, with the original strain in Omicron and having the fastest booster programme across Europe. And I pay a tribute to my predecessor and um, all the colleagues in, in the tireless work they did in that area. I think, um, as, as mentioned by uh, many um, colleagues, including uh, Lord Bethel, um, I think we all agree that prevention is better than cure and it's the best defence. Uh, not only has vaccines been proven to stop serious illness, but actually, um, more anecdotally accepted, but they are thought to also reduce the risk of long COVID. Um, and there's been, um, as we all know, 139 vaccine doses uh, that we've administered, 40 million boosters, and a real world-class programme. And, and again, to Lord Brooks' earliest points, actually, um, rather than being one of the worst in Europe, if you look at excess deaths, which I think is the internationally recognised definition of it all, you will actually find that um, we are one of the best in Europe. Um, but I agree with Lord Bethel that we need to take what we have done in the prevention space of COVID and, and really bring that into the research and prevention space in long COVID. Um, so that brings me on to the point of research, again, a point uh, mentioned by many of, um, many of us here um, and uh, very well made that it's not just research into COVID itself, but as, as um, points made by uh, Baroness Scott and Baroness Meacher, it's linking not just long COVID, um, but um, how that might um, connect with ME, chronic fatigue syndrome and, and other similar mention, um, um, areas. Um, as we know, it is a complex area. Again, um, uh, various speakers, uh, Baroness Masham, Viscount Stansgate, um, have all mentioned uh, how complex this is. Um, and so we need to make sure uh, uh, that our research really does dig into all these areas. I believe there's actually 220 different syndromes, uh, symptoms in, included in all of this. And so some of the research we've, that we've done in this um, space such as the REACT study which, uh, from Imperial, which of course Lord Darcy has been so involved in, um, the UCL um, research um, on, uh, on brain fog, uh, mentioned by Viscount Stangate, and again very much, um, I'm sure Baroness Neuberger is connected given her UCH uh, connections, are all very vital in this. And also, you know, honest debates, there is also research into uh, weight management um, as, as, and, and its impact in, in, um, in long COVID, um, as brought up by uh, Lord Brooke. So I think we all agree that this has got to be an honest debate about really understanding what are the drivers behind it, um, and we need to be clear in that. I can commit into that um, that that 50 million is protected, 50 million of research that we're doing into this space um, is protected, and I think as Baroness Brinton <laughs> brought up in her excellent history lesson, and I will look up Pale Rider, um, but there are many lessons to learn from Spanish flu, and I agree, COVID, unfortunately, is, is not over. So um, you have from me a, a commitment in terms of that, uh, that research uh, going forward. 
And I must say in that, uh, to answer the, our levels of investment and the point made by Lord Brooke, actually the £50 million that we're investing in research is second only, I believe, to the USA in this. So it is something that we are um, very much um, uh, the leaders of. Um, and this is in addition to the £108 million spent on COVID research to date. And again, to answer the point made by Baroness Thornton, we are fully committed to international research in this space and making sure that we are not only you know, a two-way process, not only are we uh, making sure we're sharing all our, funding, our findings, but we're actually committing our, our, um, our input and our data to it as well. In, in terms of data, um, I think it was in some excellent points made, again, by Baroness Thornton and, um, and Lord Kakar um, and uh, Lord Griffiths. Um, it's, you know, I, I think you've all heard me say before, I'm, I'm a bit of a data anarch, um, and so I totally understand the value of data in this space. Um, I will make sure that you have a detailed answer on, on, on this area, um, but it is something which I very much support and um, is something which I believe we, 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 we need to be doing. Um, and I, what, what I would say in all of this as well is that funding is actually still available. So again, uh, some of the points made by um, Baroness Scott and Baroness Meacher in terms of trying to understand how long COVID might interact or, or have similarities with ME and uh, chronic fatigue. Um, there is still funds available and some of the points made about the, uh, Bishop at Exeter and, and some of the rural impacts, again, um, I think there is, um, there is scope there. Um, and to Lord Karkar's point, do we need to do more? As I say, right now, that 50 million, there is still funds available within that but it's something that we believe in. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, we know um, from short COVID, if that's the right word for it all, our research was vital. And it's something that we continue to be committed to play a leading role on the world stage going forward. But we all know that research is only really good or uh, only any, any point if it actually creates treatments that we can use uh, within the NHS. Again, um, points made by many of the speakers here, that only if these are substituted into, um, ser into services uh, are they really going to be um, uh, result in really helping. The uh, UK was actually one of the first countries to recognise and respond to low COVID, and we set up the National Long COVID Commission guidance with new care pathways. And as part of that, as mentioned again by uh, many speakers, including um, Earl Kanklati, um, access to that information and educating the doctors is key to that and it's something that the Royal College of GPs and the Health um, Education um, HEE have, um, have uh, put out information but um, clearly from some of the examples given today uh, there's examples where that hasn't uh, been disseminated far enough. Um, the 224 million, and I, I appreciate the, the, the tips from Baroness Taylor in terms of uh, uh, getting the extra funding um, from, the, uh, from the Chancellor. I think I saw as we came through, um, as many of us might have picked up, that um, there has been uh, extra funding announced uh, in the other um, house just, uh, just shortly uh, before this. But I appreciate the, <laughs> the tips, and, and believe me, I will be, I will be using those um, going forward. Uh, and I can assure uh, Baroness Neuberger, uh, Neuberger as to this funding, the 224 million that we've already invested in this space is a commitment that's helped set up 100 specialist treatment centres, um, many in rural areas. I had a chance to look up quickly, and I think I counted seven in Devon, um, but I will, uh, I will confirm in case I've, I've, I've got that right, because, of course, it's not just an inner city issue. Um, it's a it's a whole country issue. Um, and within that as well, um, in terms of its impact on, on young people and children, uh, points again made by Baroness Watkins and Baroness Masham, um, there are actually 14 of those 100 um, centres are actually specialists in the area of children, and so helping to do this. Uh, the points have been very well made, though, again, around awareness by Baroness Donaghy, uh, Baroness Pirkethi, and Earl Kanklati around, this is only any good if we're making people aware of it all. And I think one thing um, I am quite proud of what we've managed to achieve is on the you, Your COVID Recovery app, where we've actually had 12 million visits um, to, uh, to, to, from people 
looking at advice on how they can recover. Um, but by that, um, I'm, I'm by no means complacent about the need to make sure that we are making sure there's advice everywhere. Um, I will need to get back to uh, Viscount um, Stanson on the, uh, I'm not even sure I'm going to pronounce it back to McKin properly, um, but um, as I say, I, I will need to get some detailed advice um, on all of that. I, I, I would say generally though, and I think Al Clancarty was talking about people feeling the need to go to private um, centres um, and often try um, unproven medicines, um, I would um, like to caution um, against that, as I'm sure many of us would agree. Um, uh, whilst this is a complex area and we are still learning on it all, um, I would advise people to stick to uh, the, the proven methods that we're trying to adopt through our own NICE guidelines and through our own um, uh, centres. Um, so that's what we're trying to do right now on NHS, but um, as, as um, Baroness Brinton and others have mentioned, um, this is not, uh, you know, this is not a one and done. Um, this is, you know, this is a, a long run thing, and so these services will need to evolve over time, and uh, we will need to keep up in this in this space. But then, um, you know, I think looking at what we were doing health-wise, as we all know, is um, is only part of the picture. Again, uh, points made started very well by Lord Bethel, but then contributed by a number of uh, number of um, lords uh, in terms of the whole impact in the employment space, the work and schools, and as well said by Lord Griffiths on a personal on a personal basis um, as as well. Um, it is something that um, um, you know it is much wider the impact on all of this. And uh, I very much recognise the impact on employment and work. As many of you will know, I was the lead NED of the Department of Work and Pensions before I came into this role. And so very aware of the 2.5 million out of work due to long-term sickness, which we know now that long um, COVID is contributing towards. And so you know, action in this area to help them is not only vital to their health, um, it's also vital to the health of the economy. And so I know it is the priority of the colleagues at DWP, and uh, this is part of the 1.3 billion investment uh, they're putting to support the long-term sick into work. Within this, though, I, 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 I totally accept the points made by um, um, a number of um, uh, people, including Baroness Donaghy, Baroness Watkins, Bar uh, Baroness Maysham and, and Newberger, and Baroness Brinton, of course, as well, about the impact of our own NHS staff. In terms, of, in terms of long COVID, and it, it's something that we need to make sure we are supporting them. Um, I have done a bit of research in terms of um, you know, whether this can be defined in terms of the occupation diseases that um, is mentioned. It is a complex out, um, area because, as we, as we mentioned before, there's 220 different uh, symptoms connected with it all, um, but the DWP is being advised by the Independent Industrial Injuries Advisory Council on this, and uh, they've actually recently published a paper prescribing five complications um, following COVID, which should be considered in the PIP, in the personal independence payments. So um, I, I'm sure this will be a, an evolving picture, but I know it is something that my DWP colleagues are on. But of course, it's much wider than that. Um, this is something that should be embraced by all employers. I'm very pleased to say I have an opportunity to speak at the CBI conference um, shortly about health in the workspace. And this is something that uh, I plan to, uh, to, to bring up in there um, because um, it is important that all our employers, I think as, as a consultation document recently went out, which we are going to respond to shortly, health is everyone's business. And uh, clearly uh, the role of employers is key to all of that. And personally, what I would like to see in all of that is very much the sort of approach we see in Japan, where you see employers really taking on a big role in, in, the, um, in the employment and the health of their workforce and looking very much at prevention. And so it's not just our own health service, which is looking at pre prevention methods, as Lord Bethel um, said. Um, we really do need to be looking at you know, the, the MOTs, the cardiovascular impacts and work we can do, um, um, giving people over 50 MOTs. But really, we should be looking to see how employers can help in that workspace as well. So I, I hope I've managed to answer many of the points 
brought up today. As I say, I commit um, where there are points of details that I haven't managed to cover to ensure um, in a detailed response uh, that we cover those. I'd like to summarise by thanking Baroness Thornton again and all the speakers. Um, I, I found it a very informative debate. Um, I think what we can all say is that uh, we've got much more to learn about long COVID. It's something that we need to be continue to be guided by the science, um, but it's a virus which definitely has not gone away. And unfortunately, as, as mentioned by many, we're going to have to live with COVID, uh, with COVID and long COVID for a long time to come. So with that, we need to continue to be proactive to prevent through our vaccine programmes, to treat through the NH, uh, NHS services, to research, to continually improve our understanding and support people to get back into work. I'd like to thank the Noble Lords. My Lords, um, I'd like to thank um, uh, the Minister for that reply. Um, and I also would like to particularly thank um, the Noble Lady Baroness Neuberger for outing me because I didn't declare my interest as a non-executive director of the Whittington. She's my boss there. <laughs> um, I want to just use these last few minutes just to say that um, uh, So I thought this was an excellent debate. I, think, I hope it will have the kind of impact that most of the speakers have said that they would like to have. And I'd like to just mention a few people. Lord, Lord Bethel, can I thank him for a very a wonderful contribution? There was a time when the noble Lord and I felt that we saw more of each other than we did of our partners. <laughs> and I also include the noble Lady Baroness Brinton in that comment. Um, and uh, just a couple of things. Um, can I say to Baroness Scott and Baroness Meacher that you are quite correct to make the links that they are doing? Um, and to, to raise issues like there being no diagnostic blood tests for ME and, um, and CFS even now. Can I also say to my noble friend Baroness Donoghue, she's completely right about the need to raise awareness. The noble Lord, Lord Kekar, always is concise and I'm always grateful for the, for the medical exposition which he gives, which I would never have dared to have attempted, but I was rather hoping that he would do so and indeed he did. Um, and I wish I had thought of the words national protocol in this regard. And I hope that the Noble Lord, the Minister, will actually take the opportunity of looking at what the Noble Lord, Lord Kekar, said about how data, data could be used. Because I, not that I wish to bring the two together, because I'm sure you know each other, but actually, you know, I thought that was actually a very pertinent offer. Um, right Reverend Prelate and um, Noble Lady Baroness Watkins brought to us the attention of the problems in rural areas and also particularly the problems of, of um, mental health. And we're very grateful to my noble friend, Viscount Stansgate, because he and other noble lords, Lord Plancarty um, and Baroness Masham, so on, they talked about the personal experiences of people they've spoken to, about the experience of long COVID. And I think it's very important in this chamber, we give voice to those experiences. And many noble lords did that. And I really rather hope that they would, because I knew I would not be able to do that in my opening remarks. I'm very grateful to my noble friend, Lord Griffiths, for his extremely kind words, but also for bringing and reminding us, as he often does, about the human costs of the pandemic. Um, not just the medical costs, but the human costs of it. My noble friend, Baroness Taylor, talking about the significance of long COVID for society. And I was very struck by the noble lady, Baroness Brinton, again, reminding me of the book that I have still got to read. <laughs> I promise her that I will now read it because she says, you know, history has things to teach us and we need to hear those words and the noble Lord, the minister needs to do so too. Um, my noble friend, Baroness Pitt Keithley, of course, talked quite rightly about carers and unpaid carers. And I'd like to also thank her for her roundup of all of this, which was so very expert. Um, the noble Lord, the minister, I thought, did the best he could under, you know, what is it actually a very, I have been in his place. There are so many experts in this house and all you can do when you are the minister is to do your best with them. But I do think, that the noble lord needs to go through this debate i asked about eight or nine specific questions um, 
some of which the noble lord answered and some of which he didn't answer. For example, he has not answered, addressed the question of the Industrial Injuries Advisories Council, for example. I think that's very important for our NHS staff, that they know what the answer to that is. So I would be very grateful if the noble lord, the minister could, and his officials could go through this debate, pick out those questions and write to everybody who took part in this debate and put this answer in the, in, in the library so that we will be able to actually see and, and take this forward as we know we'll need to. I beg to move. The question is that this motion be agreed to. As many 